Okay. Super. It looks like everybody is coming in. Welcome all to um, this webinar, the next in our ongoing series from the Society of Psychotherapy Research, or SPR. Uh, my name is Natalie Podgman, and I am one of the uh, webinar coordinators for SPR's uh, Communications Committee. And before I introduce our excellent speaker for today, I'd like to give um, just a little bit of an overview of how this is going to work, technically speaking, and um, a little bit more information about the society. Uh, so first off, I just want to let everyone know that we are recording this talk along with all of the webinars in this series um, so that we can post to our YouTube page and website. Um, so we will be keeping everybody's camera off. Um, if you have questions during the webinar, you can raise your hand using you know, the raise hand function on Zoom um, or enter a question into the chat box. And um, Dr. Hayes has, has let me know that he'll you know, accept questions throughout the talk. So um, if you raise your hand, I can unmute you. Um, or if you type a question into the chat, I'll read it off um, periodically as it comes up throughout the, the talk. Um, and so, like I mentioned, just for a little bit of information about SPR, we are an international scientific organization devoted to promoting psychotherapy research across theoretical orientations, professional disciplines, and treatment modalities. Um, for researchers, clinicians, and students alike, SPR has a lot to offer members. Um, so in addition to this series of free webinars that is open to the public, as well as to our membership, um, SPR hosts a number of workshops that are open only to members um, throughout the year, including CE eligible workshops. Uh, one of the biggest benefits of joining SPR is belonging to a welcoming, diverse, and open community of professionals interested in studying psychotherapy. Um, there are lots of ways to connect and network with other members, including email listservs for general membership, uh, regional chapters, and student and early career uh, member listservs. The International Society has an annual meeting as well to disseminate and discuss cutting edge research. Um, and there is a student activities committee to keep early career folks engaged as well. Um, we are working on expanding our presence on social media. So as you can see, we have uh, several different handles. Um, you can follow us on uh, whatever your social media platform of choice is, or you can always visit the website at psychotherapyresearch.org. Um, and so we look forward to you know, having you learn more about SPR, and thank you for listening to the brief introduction blurb. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's speaker before handing over the mic. Um, so our webinar today will be presented by Jeff Hayes, PhD, a professor of education at the Pennsylvania State University, licensed psychologist and co-founder of the Center for Collegiate Mental Health or CCMH, which is a practice research network of college and university counseling centers. Dr. Hayes' work has been recognized with many awards over his career, including from organizations like SPR and the American Psychological Association. Um, and he recently completed his six year term as editor for psychotherapy research. Um, his talk today will draw on his own research on countertransference and the history of its study. And so even though our cameras are off, please help me welcome Dr. Hayes using Zoom React. Well, thank you very much, Natalie. It's uh, a pleasure to have this time with all of you, I see some uh, familiar names here on the side of my screen and uh, some new ones as well. So uh, welcome to those of you who are new to SBR and this webinar series. And um, so good to see uh, familiar folks as well that we just haven't been able to connect in person with during the pandemic. Hope that changes in, in Denver. As Natalie mentioned, I'm going to be uh, talking this morning about uh, the history of research on countertransference, um, my own as well as other people's. Um, <clears throat> we've been doing research on countertransference collectively for about 
70 years. And uh, there's enough research now that I think we're able to draw some substantive clinical conclusions. So I'm going to give this talk uh, with a particular eye towards some um, take home messages for the therapy that we conduct and um, training that we engage in as well. <clears throat> Oh, my screen's not advancing here. There we go. Okay, so uh, some overall goals for the, the workshop. Um, I'd like to share with you some of what I've learned about empirical research on this construct. And um, I'm gonna introduce a structural model that I developed in 1995 um, that I hope will serve as an organizing framework for um, the research that's been conducted on kenotransference. Certainly, if you have questions along the way, feel free to raise them. We don't have to wait until the end for uh, a question and answer session, although I've devoted some time to that. And uh, simultaneously, uh, I'd like to questions, uh, question any answers that you might have presupposed in your mind uh, about kenotransference um, in this era of Zoom fatigue, uh, equally important is that we enjoy our time together this morning. So I'm gonna try and make this uh, fun and, and uh, as interactive as possible. Um, how am I gonna do that? Uh, you know, I'll lecture, uh, if you'll indulge me, I'll share uh, some of what I know on this topic. Um, I'll use some case illustrations and if, you would like to share uh, some of your own, that's more than welcome. And uh, again, we'll have some time at the end for a question and answer, but i um, happy to answer questions along the way as well. <clears throat> a little bit of a background about me. As Natalie mentioned, I teach here at Penn State, um, professor in counseling psychology. I have a courtesy appointment in the psych department as well. Uh, next slide, I'll show you uh, what it looks like at Penn State about 11 months out of the year, uh, including what it's going to look like in about 10 hours. Uh, all of those students on the left are, of course, wearing masks. You just can't see it because of the snow squall. That's our campus mascot there, the Nittany Lion. Uh, I've been a licensed psychologist uh, with an active private practice for about 30 years. And as Natalie mentioned, I just finished a six year term as co-editor of uh, psychotherapy research. Um, I've also co-authored two books with Charlie Gelso um, on countertransference, one specific to countertransference and one more generally on the psychotherapy relationship. <clears throat> Uh, for those of you who don't know Charlie, here's a picture of Charlie uh, doing what he does best and what he loves the most. I see Marv and Louis' uh, names here as participants. Uh, they've all spent time on the water with Charlie. I'm indebted to Charlie. He was my mentor uh, when I was a graduate student, and he also uh, introduced me to the topic of countertransference. So I'm going to start by telling you uh, what that introduction consisted of. <clears throat> when I was uh, in my early 20s and starting off my uh, doctoral work in, in uh, psychology, um, I met with Charlie and uh, I had just arrived on campus at the University of Maryland. And uh, Charlie, at, that time was already a big name in the field. He was editor of the Journal of Counseling Psychology. Um, I thought this was great that Charlie was inviting me to meet with him in his office. You know, I thought we would talk about my adjustment to campus and, um, you know, get to know each other a bit. So I came into Charlie's office and sat down and he, uh, he said to me, so what are you gonna do your thesis on? <laughs> And uh, I hadn't a clue. And uh, during this pause, while I was trying to think of something to say, 
He said, here are three articles on countertransference. The results don't square up with each other. You figure out why, and that'll be your thesis. And uh, I had the good sense not to tell Charlie that I had no idea what countertransference was. It wasn't a term that was covered in my undergraduate curriculum. And <clears throat> I looked at him and he said, that's all, you can go now. <laughs> and I got up and I left his office and uh, met with him a few weeks later. And I was already intrigued by the construct. And by the time I graduated, uh, with the exception of Charlie, I had written more about countertransference from an empirical perspective than um, just about anyone. Um, that was a long time ago. And uh, I've continued to do research on countertransference. Uh, I find it quite challenging to study, and I find that it um, both informs and is informed by my clinical work. Um, I'm married to a full-time psychotherapist. This is our typical dinner conversation now that the kids are grown and gone. Uh, countertransference in her work, my work. Uh, we do couples work together. That stirs up countertransference issues that uh, we talk about. So it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, we ought to be clear at the outset uh, what we mean when we're talking about countertransference. This construct has a complicated definitional history. Um, there are uh, four different ways that the term is used in the literature. I don't want to belabor this point, but I do want to make it clear that um, when I'm going to shift our focus to research on countertransference, I'm gonna be talking about the fourth of these definitions, the integrative definition. But to start, the classical definition uh, stems from Freud's own writing. Um, in 1910, Freud introduced this construct to refer to our reactions to clients that are unconscious, or if you're a cognitive behavioral therapist, feel free to insert the word automatic instead. Um, reactions that are defensive, they meet our needs rather than the clients, and very specifically reactions in uh, response to transference. Um, as a result of Freud's use of the term in these um, very narrow and sort of negative ways, the construct took on uh, a taboo uh, nature. Not many people um, were likely to admit that they had countertransference. Um, and, uh, you know, it wasn't the sort of thing that got talked about around the, the water cooler. And um, as a result, uh, even though Freud attached great meaning to the construct, uh, people didn't write about it or study it uh, until about the 1950s. And then everything uh, changed when uh, a group of scholars use the term in a more totalistic fashion um, to refer to any of our reactions to a client, whether conscious or unconscious in response to transference or um, just about anything. Um, this totalistic definition opened up uh, the, um, the construct in a variety of clinical ways. So it was recognition that if we study our own reactions to clients, uh, we can drive insight into the client, into the work, um, and maybe into ourselves. Um, and the term came to be uh, used in such a way that it was recognized that we all have reactions, of course, to our clients, regardless of our theoretical approach, whether we're doing group or family or individual therapy. And um, the term was written about um, pretty widely in the 1950s. Um, and today, if you were to talk with a colleague and say that you had a counter-transference reaction to a client, um, most people would be using the totalistic definition. But from my perspective, there are problems with it. Um, if any and all of our reactions to clients are countertransference. Uh, why use the term countertransference at all? Why not simply refer to therapist reactions? 
Um, it's not to belittle reactions that we have at all. They're all important, but it's pretty important uh, to understand where those reactions are coming from, what the source of them happens to be. Um, you know, if I'm working with a client who has a thought disorder and I don't have, um, you know, the training to work with that sort of a, a client, um, those sorts of reactions are very different than, let's say, uh, you know, if I'm worn out because I've seen eight clients already today or 35 clients already this week, or if I have reactions to that client um, because of unresolved personal issues, or uh, let's say I'm working with a client who's just lost a loved one and uh, I feel sad. You know, is my sadness counter-transference or is it a result of empathic attunement? So uh, obviously there are different implications about what we ought to do based on the source of our reaction to a client. Um, we ought to get training if we've got skill deficits, rest if we're um, wiped out, personal therapy if our own unresolved issues are at play. <clears throat> the third definition of countertransference comes from interpersonal theory. It recognizes that um, clients exert pulls on people in general, including us. And this complementary definition of countertransference has been uh, written about by some of the big names that you see at the bottom of your screen here. And um, while it's a mistake, I think, to blame our reactions on clients, as some people uh, in the literature tend to do, there is at least the, the recognition that um, clients with particular interpersonal styles evoke uh, cognitive and behavioral and physiological and affective reactions in us. And the point is that we can pay attention to this information and um, use it to better understand the client and um, where we're to go in our interpersonal work with the, with the client. The integrative definition that uh, Gelso and Carter first formulated in 1984 recognizes that um, there are elements that are useful from each of these three previous definitions. And the integrative definition identifies kind of transference. It's those reactions that we have to clients that stem from our own areas of unresolved conflict, or if you prefer our vulnerabilities, our blind spots. And this is the definition that's been used in most research on countertransference, although not all by any means. This definition is broader than Freud's classical definition. Uh, it's narrower than the totalistic definition that's in vogue right now because it acknowledges the source of our reactions to clients is stemming from areas of unresolved conflict. And it also acknowledges that um, there are client factors that contribute to our reactions. Okay, so as I mentioned, it's the basis for uh, most research that's been done on countertransference. So where does the history or the story of countertransference research begin? Uh, about 70 years ago, Fiedler did um, uh, the first published study on countertransference uh, was a card sort that he did to study uh, therapists' perceptions of clients. And later in that decade, in 58, Cutler did a, an interesting study where uh, he tried to identify therapists' areas of unresolved conflict. And then um, he looked at uh, the content of what clients talked about in sessions. And after sessions were over, um, he would ask the, the therapist, um, you know, how often, what percentage of your session, how many minutes did the client talk about X? And when X was related to some area of unresolved conflict in the therapist, 
the therapist tended to have wildly distorted perceptions of how frequently during the session the client talked about a particular topic. They were much more accurate in their perceptions of what the client talked about when the client uh, was talking about something that was not related to an area of conflict for the therapist. So for the therapist who has hangups about sex, uh, he asked the therapist, how much did the client talk about sex? And they said, well, not at all. <laughs> or that's all the client talked about when maybe the client talked about sex for 12 out of the 50 minutes. <clears throat> so those were the only two published studies on countertransference in the 50s. In the 60s, there were a handful of uh, experimental analogs uh, that were conducted. Uh, Bandura did a, a study that paved the way for some future measurement of, um, of countertransference. I'll loop back to that. Uh, Euless and Kiesler, Don Kiesler published a study in the late 60s looking at um, how different types of clients, angry clients, seductive clients, dependent clients, evoked different reactions in therapists. Um, that study, uh, like others, um, worked under this hypothesis that certain types of clients would predictably evoke certain responses in therapists um, tended to uh, not meet with much success because they didn't take into consideration um, the fact that some of us are, you know, more comfortable with their, with client anger than others of us. Some of us are um, really bothered by uh, dependent clients, others of us not so much. In the 1970s, uh, things just seemed to go underground. There wasn't any published research, uh, a couple of dissertations, but um, really um, the, the field was sort of quiet in terms of research on Kenner transference. And uh, things started to change in the 1980s, again, largely due to, to Charlie and uh, some of his um, doctoral students um, who picked back up with uh, analog research that affords you know, control over independent variables. Um, and uh, things began to accelerate in the 1990s. Um, there was not only uh, analog research that was done in the lab, but we moved into the field and um, branched out so that we were conducting not only quantitative, but also qualitative research. And um, we're to the point now that we're able to conduct meta-analytic work on countertransference and, and um, get some you know, views of uh, what's going on from 25,000 feet and tie together research findings. So um, I'll present some of the results of those meta-analyses in just a bit. Natalie, I'm trusting that there are no questions yet that you're aware of. Nothing that's come up, uh, nothing in the chat. Okay, all right. <clears throat> so when I first started uh, <laughs> in on um, doing my master's thesis on kind of transference, um, my, my sense was that the research that had been conducted at that time um, tested a wide range of hypotheses. There were, you know, a smattering of researchers at different labs across the country. Um, what had been found was difficult to synthesize in any sort of meaningful way. And I thought it might be helpful um, for myself as someone who wanted to conduct more research on countertransference and maybe also for the field to come up with some sort of a, an overarching framework that um, might help provide a, a, a roadmap, if you will, for um, future research on countertransference and might help us to tie together findings that were in place at the time. So in 1995, I uh, published a theoretical paper that 
broke countertransference down into five components. Um, and this is the model here. Uh, talk about the origins, triggers, manifestations, effects, and maybe most importantly, management of countertransference. So what do I mean by origins of countertransference? These are our areas of unresolved conflict, our blind spots, our vulnerabilities. Um, in a couple of the qualitative studies that uh, I've been associated with, uh, we interviewed therapists about recently terminated cases. And in uh, one study, a therapist talked about um, sort of a chronic need for approval that manifested itself in this case that he had recently wrapped up with. Uh, he talked about how he had never been the popular kid in school. He wasn't an athlete, you know, he didn't hang out with uh, the popular crowd. Um, and, uh, you know, it was remarkable. He seemed pretty self aware. Uh, in terms of these unresolved issues. And um, years later, somewhat uh, strikingly, this therapist who uh, I didn't know, but who spoke very openly about his countertransference issues, uh, lost his license for having sex with multiple clients. Um, obviously, the self-awareness that he had around uh, his need for approval did not keep him from um, violating boundaries in, in therapy. Uh, a second therapist in a different study talked, um, not as openly, but did talk about uh, a rough stretch that she was going through in her marriage. And she was working with a client who uh, was engaged to be married and was thinking of calling off the engagement. Um, this therapist uh, was in a study that Clara Hill was conducting, and um, therapists were to see clients for between 12 and 20 sessions. And at session 12, this therapist um, blindsided everyone, the client, the researchers, and um, dropped a fairly worthless piece of advice on the client told the client to stay with the engagement, that it would all work out, and abruptly terminated therapy. Uh, so, uh, you know, these sort of unresolved issues, whether they're chronic or acute, can profoundly affect our work with clients. Um, Jeff, there have been a couple comments that came in that I wonder if it would be useful to address um, earlier on as they kind of sure. relate to terms um, and how we how we define uh, different things related to therapy and kind of transference. Mm -hmm. um, so first comment says, um, is, is pointing out the use of the word clients and saying the, mm -hmm. the mere fact of calling clients um, people who need our help implies the acceptance of a certain commercial way um, to relate to what might otherwise be referred to as patients. Mm -hmm. um, the concepts of class transference and countertransference may be essential uh, in treatments where underserved people receive services. Um, so that's related to the use of clients. Um, point, point well taken. Yeah, there's a variety of preferences in terms of language here. So. Yeah, uh, point well taken. Yeah, and then there's another comment um, related to, you know, the the use of the word management of countertransference versus something like use. And I don't know if that's something that will come up later in the talk. Yeah, yeah, we'll get into that with the fifth part of the model. Um, yeah, just to anticipate the the question, um, when we manage countertransference, we can try and um, minimize the frequency of um, negative uh, repercussions or when countertransference does occur the, then the important question is yeah how do we um, try and make use of it and do we disclose internal reactions with clients um, we've done some research on that and I'll, I'll talk about those findings but i would say that um, absolutely management encompasses 
um, trying to prevent adverse effects from our own um, unresolved issues. And in line with the wounded healer notion, trying to make use of um, our own woundedness in uh, service of the work that we do with other people. Okay, great. Was there another uh, comment or question that just came up? Oh, yeah. Um, let's see. So Denise followed up to, to note that it might be interesting to connect this concept to the concepts of self-analysis and autoethnography um, as ways to know the world um, where the subjective experience is a source of information. Yeah, yeah, good point. You want to collaborate, Denise? Uh, I, I don't know much about those methods, but um, yeah, it is so challenging to study this construct. And I think that borrowing um, from well-established methods in, in other fields is uh, always welcome. Um, doing uh, some research right now where we're uh, trying to build on Oria Tishby and Hadass Weisman's work where they've used the CCRT uh, to study countertransference and um, what Oria and Hadass have found, as some of you probably know, is that when we ask therapists to tell us narratives about their patients uh, or clients, if you prefer, um, uh, and we ask the therapist to tell us narratives about people who are important in their lives, parents or kids or partners, uh, we often find similar themes in their narratives. And um, what we're trying to do is extend uh, Uri and Hadassah's work and their students' uh, work to see if those narratives um, actually show up in people's uh, work with clients. Um, can we detect certain wishes, responses from the other, responses from the self, um, and is this a, a promising way to study countertransference? And the preliminary answer seems to be yes. So, yeah, um, always looking for new and, and better ways to study this construct. Although it's really difficult um, when you're relying on the therapist in any form of self report um, because people have to be willing to be. Uh, interviewed or put under a microscope and they have to be honest and uh, we're not always aware of what's going on internally um, which part of the challenge of doing research in this area all right let's press on here okay so from a training perspective, from a clinical perspective, the important questions are how well do you know your own areas of unresolved conflict, your own vulnerabilities or blind spots, which kinds of clients or patients or people in general do you find difficult and why? Uh, and uh, oh, Christoph, I'm sorry. Uh, CCRT is the core conflictual relationship theme that Lester Laborski um, developed at Penn, and um, he and Paul Kurtz Christoph, Mary Beth Connolly Gibbons have um, done a lot of work uh, originally, and now it's um, quite popular in Brazil and Germany. Different versions of the C CCRT have been uh, developed, um, but it's a um, one fairly popular way to study transference. And we're trying to find out if uh, we can use this method to study countertransference. So um, I can send you some references, Christoph, if uh, you're interested in, in that. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so to really engage in serious self-study is uh, an ongoing and, and very difficult work. Um, there's a quote from Thoreau uh, said, it's as difficult to perceive ourselves accurately as it is to see behind ourselves without turning around, suggesting that we need help um, looking in the mirror or maybe other people 
can help us to see ourselves accurately or see behind ourselves metaphorically. <clears throat> okay. But as demanding as this work is to know ourselves, it's equally uh, rewarding if we're uh, willing to undertake a serious and uh, long-standing self-examination. A French priest, Henry Nouwen, wrote in a book called The Wounded Healer, uh, quite eloquently, I think, a deep understanding of our own pain this is the reward, makes it possible to convert weakness into strength and to offer our own experience as a source of healing to those who are often lost in the darkness of their own misunderstood sufferings. Um, and just as one piece of empirical support for this notion of the wounded healer, uh, which of course shows up in many different cultures in uh, Chinese mythology, African mythology, Greek mythology, um, we know from uh, some good research that uh, substance abuse treatment is equally effective, whether it's offered by less traditionally educated therapists who are in recovery from their own addiction, or um, probably most of the people on this call who are more educated um, and don't have a history of addiction. Uh, that's on the one hand, a, a little bit humbling, and on the other hand, um, hopeful in terms of, uh, again, using our own countertransference, as um, was mentioned earlier, um, provided that our wounds are sufficiently healed. Um, let's see. Yeah, let's, let's move on. I, I could give a clinical example here, but I'll do that if there's enough time. All right, the second component of the model uh, are triggers. These are factors, therapy-related factors that provoke our origins, our unresolved conflicts. <clears throat> uh, typically, what triggers our countertransference is something that the client does, um, but maybe less obviously, when there's a change in the structure of therapy, um, notably when termination is approaching, uh, this can stir countertransference. Most of us are terrible at saying goodbye. Um, in my culture, we talk about the Irish goodbye, where we don't engage in saying goodbye at all. Um, another common trigger for countertransference is um, when the client reminds us of some important person in our life. Uh, could be some previous client with similar clinical features, uh, could be a family member, uh, could be ourselves, uh, could be a physical characteristic, a personality characteristic of the client that serves as some sort of trigger for unresolved issues in ourselves. And if we take origins and triggers together, we can consider these to be the causes of countertransference. Uh, Charlie and I have written about the interaction hypothesis that says, you know, it's not the case that having unresolved issues necessarily lead, leads to countertransference. These have to be provoked in some sort of way. You know, um, we all have unresolved issues. But some of them are more or less dormant, and um, while some are uh, more chronic and, and get stirred up more often in our work, there does need to be some uh, provocation of these issues in order for countertransference to arise. <clears throat> of course, from a clinical perspective, we don't wanna be triggered. Uh, to be triggered is to react, and we should be responsive to our clients. Some of the work that uh, George Silbershots and his uh, colleagues are doing now is, I think, really helping us to be mindful of the fact that we wanna be responsive and not reactive to our clients. 
stated uh, somewhat differently, the most important therapist you've never heard of, Roberto Asagioli, who's an Italian contemporary of Freud's, wrote that uh, we're dominated by everything with which our self is identified. Uh, at the same time, we can dominate and control everything from which we disidentify ourselves. Manifestations, the third component of the model, these are simply those reactions that we have when our countertransference is stirred up. And we can talk about uh, manifestations on several different levels. <clears throat> um, just before his death, Donald Kiesler wrote what I thought was a uh, critically important article in a special issue of the Journal of Clinical Psychology in session that was devoted to countertransference. And uh, Kiesler wrote a piece where he considered all the different ways that countertransference was being used in the literature, including in that special issue. And he said, what all these different definitions have in common is that we're talking about atypical therapist reactions. And that atypicality uh, occurs in three different ways. Now, hypothetically, if we could uh, ask all of the therapists in the world how they would react to this client in this situation, we would know how idiosyncratic our reaction is at any particular point in time. Um, some of you who are uh, trainees or who are teaching practicum or internship type classes may do this, where you have uh, someone in class show a clip of their work and, and you get classmates' reactions and um, serves as great discussion uh, and maybe related to counter-transference. Um, but, you know, it, it's not the case typically when our training is done that we have um, the opportunity for this sort of rich discussion. Uh, what we can compare is my reaction to this client uh, compared to my baseline reactions to other clients. So if I tend to be, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, not very self-disclosing with most of my clients, for whatever reason, it's consistent with my theoretical orientation. And uh, I find myself um, disclosing a lot about myself to this client. I can see that that's atypical. And then I can start to wonder, well, why am I behaving in an unusual way for me compared to how I usually am with clients? Or, you know, if usually I look forward to my sessions with clients, and I suppose most of us who practice psychotherapy do, but I dread seeing this client. Why is that? Or conversely, if I'm very excited about seeing this client today, you know, are my own unresolved issues somehow coming into play here? And then Kiesler said, we can also look at atypical reactions for this session compared to other sessions with this client. So there can be a baseline uh, established within my work with a particular client. And I see um, that I'm particularly bored during this session or this part of the session, or I, I'm getting irritated or annoyed. And what's that about? You know, it's a client not getting better quickly enough. And, um, you know, it's not meeting my needs to be a good therapist. <clears throat> so uh, these manifestations, we can think of as atypical reactions and atypical on several different levels. So uh, in terms of what the client might notice, um, or if you're doing videotape reviews of your session, um, you can look at specific behaviors. And these are uh, a half, or five, six um, common behavioral manifestations of countertransference. Uh, first, uh, going all the way back to Cutler's study, um, 
you know, if the client brings up material that you find personally threatening in some way, do you tend to avoid that or change the topic? Um, you know, the client's talking about uh, a serious health issue and, um, you know, you've just been diagnosed with cancer yourself and, you know, you change the topic to talking about politics or the weather using, of course, uh, an extreme example here. We don't do that in therapy, but uh, we change the topic to something that's um, that hits not so close to home. Uh, in Bandura's study in 1965, he looked at uh, different common kind of transference reactions, and he found that when clients talked about personally threatening material, often the client, I'm sorry, the therapist didn't say anything. And it's not like these were pregnant pauses um, where there was a lot of work going on and the therapist didn't want to interrupt. Uh, the therapist um, simply was protecting herself or himself by not responding. Uh, sometimes uh, we can become overactive. And uh, I'll give you an example from my own clinical work. Uh, I had been seeing someone for um, several years uh, with whom I had a very good relationship. She was a trauma survivor. And uh, one session she came in, she was noticeably agitated and uh, uh, she began to uh, talk about um, something that had happened to her in the past that um, hit sort of close to home for me and I was not prepared to hear. Uh, I, had, um, I don't know how many of you have had this experience, sort of like an out-of-body clinical experience. I kind of got as far away from her as possible. I was up in the corner of the room watching these two people in chairs doing therapy, <clears throat> and I interrupted her, and I started talking 120 miles an hour, and I said, oh, well, you know, that's very interesting, and we're going to have to, you know, view that from a number of different perspectives and use all the containment strategies that we've de developed, and she said, what are you doing? And very slowly, I kind of came back into my chair and uh, I said, you know, I, I think I'm protecting myself. And uh, I, I said, if I'm this anxious about what you're about to share, I can only imagine how hard it was for you to work up the courage to say what it is you're about to say, much less experience it the first time. And uh, with that, the session changed and we got on with doing therapy. Um, but fortunately, you know, I had a client who could call me on uh, my atypical behavior. She knew this was not uh, baseline behavior for me and, and, uh, I was able to be empathic and, and then uh, be of some help to her. Uh, fifth, in terms of over-involvement, there's some indication, uh, I wanna be cautious about this because only three or four studies that suggest that um, there may be gender differences in terms of over or under-involvement, um, that men tend to uh, flee <laughs> when countertransference gets uh, stirred up and women can move in the direction uh, toward um, caretaking, being overly nurturing. Um, but again, just a handful of, of studies, but um, you might look for atypical behavior uh, in yourself, in your supervisees uh, as an indication of kind of transference. So the metaphorical dance of therapy comes to mind here, that if we're uh, too far apart from our clients, we don't even look like dance partners, or if we're stepping on one another's toes because I'm um, too enmeshed with the client, then that can be problematic as well. <clears throat> Natalie, it looks like there have been a couple more comments or questions. Uh, you're welcome, Irene. Um, 
Yeah, so there have been uh, a few things coming in kind of related to fairly broad theories and concepts. I wondered if it would be, um, you know, a good time to, to break in the middle of talking about manifestations or, you know, maybe wait until you covered this concept and we can kind of widen the scope a little bit. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, I'm conscious of the time here. So I'll move through manifestations. And then if it uh, looks like there are um, any cross-cutting themes in the comments or, or questions, maybe you can synth synthesize those. Um, all right. So on a cognitive basis, uh, there are lots of different ways that kind of transference can manifest itself. Uh, we can become distracted, preoccupied, engage in daydreaming, um, right? I mean, it's this is a pretty tough profession. Right, so you're seeing a client from two to three, and you have uh, all kinds of feelings and thoughts, and then uh, you know you got ten minutes to do whatever, write case notes, go to the bathroom, let go of all of that, and be present for your three o'clock client. Um, not always so easy to do, and uh, when that's compounded by having a bunch of Counter-transference reactions, or one really strong one in your previous session, um, we can become preoccupied, or we have sick kids at home, or um, whatever it, it might be. Uh, as I mentioned, with the Cutler study, study you can have um, pretty distorted recall of what your clients are talking about. And um, here, I think it's helpful. Those of you who are in, in training and and uh, engaged in reviews of tapes of your sessions, um, you know, compare your case notes to uh, what actually is transpiring and, and see what you might have missed. <clears throat> um, and you can get these biased case conceptualizations because you don't want to see particular things about your, your patients, uh, and it can alter treatment planning, as I mentioned with the therapist who just abruptly terminated after 12 sessions. On an emotional level, uh, pretty much anything and everything goes. Um, kind of transference can manifest itself uh, in any of these ways. I don't know what we did before emojis. Um, but you name it, countertransference can uh, stir up all sort of uh, emotions in us. Um, but anxiety in particular has stood out in the empirical literature as a particular marker of countertransference. And here I think uh, the cognitive theorists formulation of anxiety is uh, especially useful, that it's um, a function of perceived threat. So when I'm doing work with a client and I feel anxious, the question is, what, what's threatening here, right? So I might be concerned about my client, of course, um, why would I be anxious? What's the threat to me? Now, again, trainees, you feel anxious because you're being evaluated. A supervisor is going to watch your tape. Um, you know, you're maybe overly preoccupied about your performance as a therapist. You don't have a lot of confidence. Um, but as Mabel Cohen wrote in 1951, anxiety is a sign that something ought to be different all at once. And if we can uh, remind ourselves that the work isn't primarily about us, uh, that can alleviate some anxiety. But uh, when we are feeling anxious in session, it's typically a sign that um, our countertransference uh, is activated and our, um, there's some internal uh, movement toward self-protection, self-defense, prioritizing our own needs, perhaps at uh, the expense of our clients. 
Uh, not much research has been done about uh, what happens in the body when countertransference is uh, provoked, uh, but some Irish researchers, um, uh, and you see one reference here, have done some research to uh, suggest that headaches, uh, fatigue, arousal are common physiological indicators of countertransference. Um, and I'm not talking about this sort of fatigue that comes from, you know, seeing a bunch of clients in a day. It's like you're seeing your second client or patient of the day and uh, you're exhausted after 50 minutes. <clears throat> so, um, you know, it speaks to the importance of being attuned to the body. Uh, a friend of mine who's a professional dancer likes to remind me, uh, we lie to ourselves all the time cognitively, we can lie to ourselves emotionally, but the body uh, typically does not lie. So what do you think, Natalie? Do you wanna uh, field a couple of questions at this point? Yeah, and we'll, you know, we'll see how you feel about you know, moving on or, or saving these questions for the end, but um, there have been some fairly, uh, you know, heady conceptual links of countertransference to, um, you know, the concept of mentalization, uh, how it might relate to, you know, our mental polarities of self and other affective, cognitive, um, implicit, explicit, um, as well as where countertransference um, in your view is, is located within paradigms of psychology, um, you know, whether, yeah. uh, one psychology, positivistic, two perspective, relational, constructivistic, um, psychological paradigms. So if any of that stands out as something you'd like to latch on to, Jeff. Um, well, thanks for the warning that those were gonna be some uh, heady, heady questions. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll say just this. Uh, in terms of mentalization, I, I do think um, it's, an important related construct. Our capacity for self-reflection, introspection, self-awareness is critical to managing countertransference. I'll speak about that in just a couple of minutes. Um, I, I think that countertransference is pan-theoretical. Uh, while it originated in obviously uh, psychoanalytic um, literature, uh, I don't think that this is a clinical phenomenon that only occurs in psychodynamic work. Um, there might be language like um, automatic thoughts, automatic behaviors, uh, automatic feelings that are more appealing to um, cognitive and cognitive behavioral therapists, but we're all human. You know, there's nothing, um, special about getting a de degree or a license that uh, makes us transcend the human condition. Um, and, you know, we all have our wounds. We have original wounds even um, that from time to time get provoked in our work with clients. Um, how often does countertransference happen across theoretical orientations? Uh, our best guess from the literature is um, it depends. It depends how you're defining frequency. Countertransference doesn't happen often within sessions, maybe once or twice, but uh, in about 80% of sessions, we have found that there's at least one occurrence of countertransference, yeah. independent of theoretical orientation. So I, I do think um, that this is a pantheoretical construct, even though the terminology and the fact that the word transference is uh, rooted in it still uh, conveys uh, mistakenly, I think, that this is a, a psychodynamic construct. And um, absolutely, it's a, it's a two-person phenomenon, um, you know, it's, as I said earlier, uh, I'm not a fan of the term projective identification, like clients put things in us that cause us to react in 
certain ways. I mean, I recognize that certain types of clients are challenging to work with, and there are common reactions, say, to clients with borderline personality disorder. Um, but uh, I think it's important that we take ownership of what's ours. And uh, so more from a Sullivanian perspective, you know, this is a, a two-person endeavor. Or as Carl Jung once said, uh, when important matters are at stake, and I would say, uh, when are they not? It makes all the difference in the world whether the therapist, excuse the sexist language, hides behind the cloak of authority or involves himself in the work. <clears throat> and too often, I think, uh, <laughs> um, we can hide behind the cloak of authority and um, practice a, a, a one-chair psychology. But I, I think that's maybe not so common these days. All right, let's press ahead with the time that we've got. Uh, the fourth component of the model um, are the consequences of these reactions. Um, that is the effects of countertransference manifestations on the process and outcome of, of therapy. So this is obviously an important consideration here. So what? <laughs> uh, does it matter, you know, if, if we have um, these various reactions? And not surprisingly, what we find is that countertransference is inversely related to all the good stuff about therapy. Uh, you know, the strength of the working alliance, deep sessions, smooth sessions, and ultimately whether or not clients get better. What's a little surprising is that uh, these reactions um, tend to have uh, just modest um, correlations with uh, these important markers of therapy process and outcome. Uh, you can see uh, from a recent meta-analysis, um, you know, it's not like we're accounting for enormous portions of the variance in process or outcome here. And the good news then is that we don't have to be perfect. Um, you know, you don't have to um, pretend to be someone who we're not, as long as we're willing to take ownership of our reactions uh, when they do occur um, internally, try and uh, attend to our thoughts and feelings, our bodily sensations, uh, hopefully so that they don't spill out into behavior. Um, <clears throat> one of my doctoral students, Dave Myers, found in his dissertation that uh, if we have a strong enough working alliance with our patients uh, that um, it might even be a good idea to self-disclose about our countertransference reactions. That, that can be uh, one way of um, capitalizing on countertransference, but don't do it if the alliance isn't strong. <laughs> uh, finding was pretty clear from this dissertation. Um, clients don't want to know about it. It can um, kind of sabotage the work or uh, is the classic article um, by uh, Henry Schacht and, and Strupp uh, suggested in the title, a little bit of bad process can go a long way. Um, that's true if we don't have uh, good established working relationships with our clients. <clears throat> All right, so kind of taking a step back at, at this point, uh, you know, what are the implications for our work? Um, we ought to be engaged in reflecting on our work and uh, we're not going to have time to get to all of the PowerPoint slides that I've developed. Uh, I've left a chunk of them at the end, suspecting we wouldn't get to them. Um, where uh, I've just been doing some writing with a colleague from the University of Auckland, Claire Cartwright, about using reflective practice uh, to manage countertransference. And the first step in the model 
is to start with what's most obvious. And that is our countertransference reactions. So how am I behaving or feeling or thinking in ways that are atypical for me? What's most noticeable as I reflect on my work? And then second, <clears throat> you know, what's causing these reactions? What's happening in the work? Or as I think about my client, how do I perceive the client in ways that might be triggering these reactions? And then third, what if any sort of uh, unresolved conflicts within myself are, uh, are being stirred up or provoked that I need to attend to? Uh, I, I've seen um, Maria drop a couple of important comments in the chat box, and I, I just want to um, underscore the importance of what Maria is saying in terms of uh, attending to um, cultural variables uh, with regard to countertransference. Um, my own dissertation was um, looking at therapist homophobia as predictive of countertransference reactions with uh, gay male clients. And, um, you know, over the years, I've uh, done research looking at countertransference um, as a function of uh, a number of other cultural variables. And, um, you know, there's always more work to do here. Charlie and uh, Ruth Fassinger have done research on um, lesbian clients, uh, have done work with religious clients. We haven't paid enough attention to social class. Um, <clears throat> You know, we know there are differential therapist effects as a function of client ethnicity and race. Um, so you could consider uh, culture and our own biases and isms and prejudices uh, as uh, origins that need to be attended to and, and cultural dynamics within the therapy relationship, it's triggers of countertransference. So uh, I, I just want to underscore the importance of what uh, Maria is saying in the, in the chat box. Okay, well, I think um, probably the most important aspect of this structural model uh, and research that's been done on countertransference has to do with uh, the, the what do we do about it question. And so generally speaking, management refers to um, therapist strategies for preventing these reactions or minimizing the adverse effects of our reactions, or even, as was mentioned earlier, trying to use them in service of the work when they do occur. And you might not be surprised uh, to know that um, <clears throat> uh, recent meta-analytic work suggests that the stronger uh, our, the better our ability to manage countertransference, the more positive therapy outcomes are, and that, uh, that effect is fairly sizable. Well, how do we manage our countertransference? Um, we did some research uh, Back in the 90s, um, Charlie and Steve Van Wagner, Roberta Diemer and myself came up with an instrument called the Countertransference Factors Inventory. Um, it's got five subscales. You see them listed here. Uh, over the years, we found pretty good empirical support for these subscales. And uh, just a couple of points uh, worth making. Um, number four there, conceptualizing ability uh, in and of itself doesn't seem to be enough to manage countertransference. Um, but in interaction uh, with empathy um, and some of the other variables, self-awareness, um, it helps to have uh, these conceptual skills um, but we can't manage countertransference relying solely on our, <clears throat> on our intellect. 
So um, I wanted to point that out. And probably the most important of these five factors, we found the least empirical support for it, and that is self-awareness. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, here's the inscription over the cave at Delphi when people would go to get prophecies, uh, you know, what crop should I plant? Should we go to war? You know, uh, the first piece of advice before uh, meeting with the um, the mystic inside the cave was to know thyself and uh, easier said than done, right? Um, and easier said than to measure. Um, when you ask people how self-aware they are, um, people who don't know themselves tend to tell you that they know themselves very well. And when you ask people who know themselves relatively well, they're aware of how much more there is to know about themselves. And there's a humility factor as well. So um, measuring self-awareness is uh, quite a, a challenge. And um, sometime I'm gonna do a study on uh, using the, the Stroop effect to look at self-awareness and, and uh, see what we find. <clears throat> All right, next. Jeff, um, I'm curious with the 15 minute timer, if there are you know, points to emphasize and whether you'd like to open up for discussion, um, allowing a, a particular amount of time. I um, want to be mindful. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's just maybe go on to the next couple of slides. I want to share a couple of quotes and then I'll stop and open it up for, uh, for discussion. Uh, so here, another quote from Jung, again, apologize for the sexist language. The patient's treatment <clears throat> begins with us, so to speak. Only if the doctor knows how to cope with himself and his own problems, will he be able to teach a patient to do the same. And the next slide, I find this interesting and it supports the uh, point that I made earlier that I think countertransference is a trans theoretical construct <clears throat> that very late in his life, Carl Rogers wrote that uh, perhaps I've stressed too much the three basic conditions. We need to recognize very clearly the fact that we are imperfect with flaws that make us vulnerable. I think it's only as the therapist views him or herself as imperfect and flawed that we can help another person. So yeah, so maybe this is a good stopping point on that note. And uh, yeah, during the 15 minutes or so that we have left, be happy to answer questions or engage in a bit of a Q and A. Great, so um, one that came recently into the chat um, is asking about studies on specific psychopathology, like with eating disorders that may evoke specific kinds of countertransference. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I'm not aware of much uh, that's been done in this area. Um, we did a study that we published uh, some years ago, um, actually an undergraduate at Penn State did it for her honors thesis, where we looked at therapists who were doing grief counseling, and um, we studied their own death anxiety and unresolved loss. And we found pretty much what you would expect, that therapists who had more unresolved grief uh, were rated by their clients, um, you know, as having less uh, empathy and sessions weren't as deep or as smooth. Um, uh, I'm not. I'm not aware of many other studies along these lines, and you know, it's a compelling sort of general hypothesis. The problem is getting therapists. Uh, to A, 
engage in kind of transference research and then be open up about, you know, their own woundedness and, um, you know, be willing to advance the field by making themselves vulnerable. So, yeah, theoretically, it's, uh, it's compelling, but actually doing the, the research and finding uh, enough therapists, uh, it's, it's really difficult. Great, and we have a, let's see, a raised hand from Michael here. So I'll ask him to unmute if he wants to speak up. Hi, Michael. Hi, Jeff. Hi, thanks so much for, for this talk. It was really, really great. And oh, my pleasure. Interesting and masterful, I think. Oh, thank you. Two related points. I, I First, in itself, it's a small point, I think you said the research has shown that typically there are one or two occurrences of counter-transference in most sessions, but something in that ballpark. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm basing that on um, not very many studies, but uh, it, yeah, that's what we found in, in this um, study really that Clara Hill was responsible for back in the 80s, where we had these eight a very experienced therapist, each of whom conducted twelve to twenty sessions. So we had a ton of um, a ton of data, and and that's what we found in in that study in particular. With again, very reputable, very experienced therapists. So it's you know I'm maybe overgeneralizing from that well, that research. Yeah. So, but bridging from that. The main thing I want to ask about is the notion that countertransference is trans theoretical. Uh -huh. In the sense in which you explain what you mean by that, it makes perfect sense to me. Um, however, um, it seems to me that, uh, that there's a role of theory, and there are going to be different theories about this, yes. about how to look at countertransference. Yes. Um, and uh, so you could use, say, a psychoanalytic notion of it to look at whether it, as they define it, occur across many, many different theoretical orientations. And you might find interesting results. And so in one sense, it's trans-theoretical, but in another sense, your work is guided by a theory. So I was thinking about, imagine a case where um, you can look in a crystal ball, and it's really important, and what the patient really wants is to become more um, uh, agentic, autonomous, um, independent. Mm -hmm. However, they engage with other people in a way that pulls for caretaking. Okay? Right. And... I can imagine, I'm sure that I've been uh, guilty of this, if you want to call it guilty, probably many, many times, um, that a therapist could find themselves engaging in caretaking with that patient again and again and again and again. Yes. Um, and so it's a subtle thing. And there's nothing dramatic that one would put a headline in the newspaper about, oh, the therapist did this you know, like, for example, the sexual violent violation. It's right. a very subtle thing. But it's largely, in this hypothetical case, constantly occurring and enormously important. And it may well reflect not only the pull of the patient, but something about the therapist. And those kind of phenomena seem actually, my sense is that they're even more important than dramatic, notable, everyone would see something's wrong going on things. And yeah. I would see them as counter-transferential because another therapist, for whatever reasons going on with that person, might really respond to that same client in a very different manner, which was more yes. constructive. Yes. Well, uh, you know, as you're speaking, I'm thinking about the, um, uh, you know, 
interpersonal notion of countertransference, um, where there's a distinction between objective and subjective countertransference, right? And, and I think it's a useful distinction, um, especially if you're an interpersonal <laughs> psychotherapist. Um, but the definition is is everything. So if you're not uh, inclined to do interpersonal psychotherapy, maybe you would just say, well, uh, why invoke the term at all? But uh, this example that you're giving where I feel the pull to um, caretake, um, you know, we can lay that out on the interpersonal circle, right? And understand the pull that is being evoked in me and probably the client is evoking that pull in other people and getting reinforced for a lack of agency. Um, well, that would be an object of countertransference. But if I have a reaction to that client where, uh, you know, I'm getting annoyed, right? Uh, um, then there's something idiosyncratic or subjective about my reaction. And uh, there, I think, is the value of the complementary definition of countertransference. But it is theory specific. Um, you know, I'm not sure that uh, but, but, a practitioner from other uh, theoretical perspectives is going to even invoke the term countertransference in that situation. Right. I, in, in a way, that's really my point. Mm -hmm. And the fact that someone might get annoyed, which certainly is the case, and that that would be a different reaction is, is one thing. But as I said, in a third person therapist might uh, recognize the need to validate the independence moving steps of this person. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're all idiosyncratic, um, but, if you use the interpersonal approach, I don't know, be a challenge and a half to measure it, you might well get 50 countertransference uh, things, uh, events occurring in a session. And Right, right. And I see what you're saying. Yeah, it all depends on the definition and then the operationalization of it. Mm. <clears throat> right. I will uh, I'll just cut in here to note that there was a fairly timely question posed in the chat um, by Hadass Wiseman. Um, oh, hi, Hadass. Who asks, um, you know, about research or thoughts about countertransference in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic or um, <laughs> psychotherapy via Zoom, via, via teletherapy, how that might change. Yeah, well, <clears throat> um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, not, none of us have been spared the effects of COVID-19. And, um, you know, my wife who's seen 25 plus people a week, you know, she's hearing so much of the same stuff um, from her patients. <clears throat> and at times it's what she's dealing with, you know, and uh, in her own life and in our life. <clears throat> you know, decisions about her health and whether it's okay to travel. And um, it, uh, there's a cumulative effect, you know, it affects not only um, my work with this patient at this moment, but uh, it, it, it can wear one down. I'm, you know, speaking anecdotally here and in, in the evidence that I have um, comes from the person I live with who, uh, you know, happens to be, I, I think, a, a pretty good therapist, but she speaks openly about this. And I suspect for those of you who are in practice, um, you know, there would be some um, universal agreement about this. Um, and and it's, a, it's a challenge, you know, to, um, to be present, to be, um, really there for the next client when you've already seen six clients who are talking about, you know, running a kindergarten out of their home because this kid has, you know, a high fever and I can't get my work done and 
you know, I'm missing days here and there. And uh, <clears throat> how do you use that to empathize with the client? How do you use your own experience without becoming numb? I, I think uh, these days that's, uh, that's a challenge. In terms of tele teletherapy, some people like it. <laughs> you don't have to commute. You can wear pajama bottoms while you're, <laughs> you're doing therapy. You don't have to deal with transportation. Uh, you don't have to worry about, um, you know, catching uh, COVID from your, your patients. Uh, but time will tell, you know, about uh, teletherapy, how much uh, it's here to stay. And, for those of us, you know, who are less technologically proficient, it may introduce kind of transference issues. I don't, it's an interesting question. Absolutely, and I think it's a testament to you know, video on. So we're not talking into total space here, but I think it's a testament to the the quality of this talk and the you know complexity of this topic that there are a number of comments, questions that. You know, we don't necessarily have the time to address here, um, but Jeff, are, are you available? Would you, you know, like to have folks contact you with any questions? They might no, have? no. And so don't. I'm not getting paid enough for this talk, Natalie. No, especially. Don't reach out to, to Jeff after the webinar, everybody. <laughs> people like uh, Diego in, in particular, and Mark and Louis and Seagal. No. Uh, it's just so wonderful to see so many names. Uh, is it? No, we can't actually ask people to turn on their computers because we're recording this. But um, <clears throat> of course, uh, my email is on the, um, well, it's on the last slide, but we're not going to get to that. It's JX as an X ray, H34. Oh, are you going to drop it in the chat box? Natalie? Yeah, I'll just do that. It's JXH34 at psu.edu. Of course, I mean, I just love talking about this. So uh, be happy to carry on the conversation. Um, and just a, a plug that uh, Diego, who's on this call and his uh, colleagues in Italy are um, doing some great research on Kenner transference. And we should look for that to be presented at some future SPR conference. So thanks everyone for your time for indulging me for an hour and a half to talk about a topic near and dear to my heart. And um, yeah, feel free to um, shoot an email. And uh, if you have ideas for future research, uh, I'd love to hear them. So no, thanks for pouring in. So we all uh, appreciate you presenting this webinar today. Wonderful. And I hope to see uh, many of you in, in Denver or um, I guess a lot of conferences are going to be hybrid. So see you electronically in the future. So best wishes to everyone. Take care during this difficult time. Absolutely. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. Bye-bye.